what in the world, or maybe we should say where in the world, or what and what and where in the world, Sauvignon Blanc. The um, the aroma of Sauvignon Blanc is uh, so unique. And here, um, what is meant to be said is that the aroma of Sauvignon Blanc grape is so unique that it is impossible to confuse it with any other varieties. Uh, I know you've, this has happened to you when somebody's handed you a glass of wine blind. Uh, you've said, um, and, and said, what is this? Your most often correctly guessed wine has got to be Sauvignon Blanc. It has been compared uh, with that of uh, vanilla and muscat, but it is different and it constitutes that singular taste of Sauvignon Blanc wines. When I, when I think back on my time uh, making wine in California, when I first came uh, into the business, uh, studying it and then starting to work uh, as an enologist in the late 70s and early 80s, I know a few of you were around then, and Sauvignon Blanc had a serious identity crisis. In fact, uh, when I was so happy to get my first actual titled winemaking job and move up to Mendocino County uh, in the mid 80s, uh, we, we had some pretty good Sauvignon Blanc in the vineyard and uh, I was a trained winemaker. Um, so I, I made the cleanest, crispest, true to, true to character Sauvignon Blanc I could possibly make. That's, that's our duty, right? If you want to mess with it, fine, we can mess with it. But let's at least try to have a really good, solid, uh, clean wine made. And, um, but the problem was uh, we would present this to consumers and they would say, what is this? You, you remember that question? And, and, we, and we would say, well, it's uh, Sauvignon Blanc. And they say, it, it, it is? Sauvignon Blanc's not supposed to taste like this. Why doesn't it taste more like Chardonnay? And so uh, we, <laughs> in order to maintain our Sauvignon Blanc vineyards and keep sales happening, we had to very, very quickly morph our Sauvignon Blanc style into uh, what we called the poor man Chardonnay because you couldn't get very much for it because it wasn't real Chardonnay. It was uh, something that you stylized away from, from what you had to work with. So um, that, was, uh, that, was, that was a difficult period to, to live through. Um, and uh, we, we, were, we were really helped by uh, the Mondavi uh, creation of Fumé Blanc because it uh, pushed, helped push Sauvignon Blanc along, but it also led to a lot of, a lot of confusion and misunderstandings. Uh, uh, Fumé? What, is, what, is, what does that mean? Yeah. Smoked? Well, this wine doesn't smell smoky. Uh, well, it's, it's from, it's like the grape that we grow in the Puy sur Loire, the, the Puy Fumé. Fumé means smoke, therefore it must be smoked. Can't you smell all the wood we put in this wine? Um, so it, it, it was a real mongrel of a wine from a, from a purist, enologist, wine taster's point of view. You, you saw something that said East Upper Loire in the title, and you tasted something that said Grave uh, in the bottle, and the great Sauvignon Blanc that he had to work with, that Tocolon vineyard that you showed, pushed that, no matter what he did, it just pushed that Sauvignon Blanc right through that, that wood. And so, very, very, uh, very memorable wine, still going strong today. Um, so, um, so that was a very, very confusing period. And uh, but meanwhile, several thousand miles away, uh, and uh, Nancy Sweet is ho hopefully going to talk about this. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc was being quietly planted in the 70s, uh, late 70s, I guess, in New Zealand. And uh, uh, in the, the, the very first year that I was making Sauvignon Blanc up here in the North Coast, 1985, Cloudy Bay was founded and sort of uh, started on a slow takeoff and then absolutely skyrocketed into worldwide, worldwide fame. And uh, the, the rest is history down there. So, so I guess we have to thank the, um, the New Zealand producers for helping the world consuming public to realize that Sauvignon Blanc did have a character. It was a character and uh, it was something to be, to be, to be savored. So let's, uh, let's, have a, let's continue our, uh, our path. Um, uh, one of my daughters recently taught me what IMHO stood for, so I thought I would 
um, give her a kick and put it in my, my slide. IMHO, in my humble opinion, a, a good Sauvignon the world over should exhibit typicité and originalité. The flavors of a wine must be true to grape type, in my humble opinion, and uh, expressive of uh, the, its place of origin. In other words, each Sauvignon should express its terroir. Fortunately, with Sauvignon Blanc, you don't have too much trouble with that. It asserts itself. It reacts to its climate. It reacts to its soils. It reacts to its uh, surrounding human sensibilities, and it does. It makes unique, unique uh, terroir-driven wines everywhere. So uh, this may be a little bit, a little bit hard to read. So I'm going to skip through this quickly because you know from listening to climatology and listening to soils and uh, uh, interacting with all of your uh, winemakers' uh, friends, uh, all, of, all of the factors, all of the forces that go into uh, creating terroir expression, uh, climate, um, geological parent material and soil, uh, topography and how, how, the, how the land tilts and drains and, and faces the sun or turns its back to the sun, Vitic viticultural choices, other things growing and living in the area, animals and plants, flora and fauna, uh, and the uh, important precursors of Sauvignon Blanc expression, which are so strong in that grape variety because of its, its peculiar DNA, uh, unique DNA, uh, harvest timing, fruit handling, and so forth. Everything along the way, from the land that roots it to, to, the, to the way it's handled, to the way that it's brought in, uh, to, the, to the microbes that are in the environment and the microbes that are, right, microbes that are living in your winery um, and your, your method of handling fermentation and so forth, your method of uh, élevage, of, of nurturing the wine along until the time that you bottle it. Uh, but, but maybe um, the most important thing uh, one, one of the most important things influencing your ultimate expression in the bottle is your local sensibility to Sauvignon Blanc, your local culture, uh, you, your wine, your winemaking interaction with your consuming public, and so forth, and uh, and your traditions and your food, and uh, these vary all over the world, both both uh, old world and new. Uh, about the time you're worried about that, old world versus new world and so forth, and we could do a whole seminar on alleged or real flavors of one versus the other, Jansen's, Jansus Robinson uh, gives voice to something that we all know and suspect and or maybe fear, I don't know. It should be added, however, that as winemakers increasingly travel between wine regions, ab absorbing and applying different techniques some distinctions between what were regarded as wine archetypes are being eroded, uh, and there is more disagreement than ever as to what constitutes typicality. Well, uh, yes, I'm, I'm growing Sauvignon Blanc in Modesto, but I can make New Zealand style. <laughs> or don't, don't, don't you think my, my Sauvignon Blanc from wherever tastes just like the Loire? So uh, I think we, winemakers are uh, always in search of uh, tricks. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a lot of discussion among winemakers, which we won't really get into here, about uh, reductive versus oxidative styles of winemaking. Uh, the new world, it, it, to use a broad brush, uh, tends to embrace uh, reductive style winemaking, uh, which is sort of boy in the, boy in the bubble, protective, custody of, of, your, of your grapes and of your wine, making sure everything is cool and protected and oxygen is excluded. Uh, whereas people I've worked with um, on the European continent, uh, whereas they may uh, have temperature control and judicious use of SO2 and blah, 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 uh, after fermentation, the wine is transferred out to uh, more of a passive oak cask or a, or a concrete storage tank. So after the initial period of fermentation, the interaction with the wine is a little more laissez-faire. So the wine grows up more rapidly and uh, that affects what volatiles it acquires and what volatiles it uh, retains. So what am I talking about? What constitutes this typicity or this flavor signature of Sauvignon Blanc that we 
that we're talking about? What are, what are the flavor markers of Sauvignon Blanc? Uh, Denis uh, de Bourdieu, God, God rest his soul, uh, almost imperceptible in unfermented must, the aroma characteristics of Sauvignon Blanc wines uh, uh, mainly develops during alcoholic fermentation from the aroma-less precursors in the must. You know that to be true. Uh, there are very few uh, gr there are very few grapes that that taste like the final wine they're going to make, right? Mus Muscat does, of course, and uh, Gewurztraminer sometimes. But for the most part, you close your eyes and taste a ripe white grape out in the field. Uh, it, it bears very little or no resemblance to the wine it's going to make. All of those flavor precursors are in the are in the uh, DNA uh, acquired uh, flavor of the uh, the matrix of the grape. So uh, a long time ago, um, uh, Denis' predecessor Emile Peynot said, "It is the winemaking which reveals the aroma hidden in the fruit." The wine tastes more of fruits and grape than the grape does. Fermentation acts to reveal aroma by liberating the aroma compounds in the Sauvignon Blanc grape. And of course, we know now more and more about how that actually happens. Uh, so the schools of, of uh, the broad schools of Sauvignon Blanc flavor, which we all know, are the fruity floral school, the veggie grassy herbal set. Uh, the stylized set, which is when we do more to the wine than the wine gives to us, and on very, various combinations of the above. So in the fruity floral uh, arena, we have uh, things like terpenes, thiols, and esters, uh, ranging from citrus. Um, and I find in Sauvignon Blanc, the citrus flavors resemble more the zest than the actual juice. Uh, melon and fig. Apple, apple and pear, uh, stone fruits, apricot and peach, pineapple and trop, tropical fruits, guava, passion, mango, and, and green fruits. Uh, I call them green fruits, gooseberry. Uh, you know, when I first started working in New Zealand and tasting with all of my, my making uh, colleagues and friends down there, um, they had a whole different vocabulary than I did. Well, they, we had, our vocabulary intersected quite a bit. We, we used the same, a lot of the same tasting uh, nomenclature. But then they started getting off into all of these strange fruits that I don't grow in Mendocino County. So the first thing I had to do was go to the produce guy after work and say, hey, show me what you got. And so I would buy one or two of each of the various fruits that were local. And, uh, and taste them and try to, try to learn to adopt those, uh, those terms to my tasting notes. So in this fl uh, fruity floral uh, zone, uh, wines can contain uh, monoterpenes, which can make them very floral, floral very, uh, very uh, floral fruity smelling. Uh, the ones that we know the most about, I think, are the, the monoterpenes linalool, uh, also cit uh, citronellol and geraniol. Uh, and then there's another uh, very uh, complicated phenolic compound that, that just is simply described by tasters as green. Uh, and then there are others that are sweet, rose-like, or lilac, or floral. So th these are minor players uh, in Sauvignon Blanc aroma profile, uh, but uh, some sometimes uh, noticed. Uh, of course, depending on fermentation regime uh, and, ch and choice of yeast, which we'll hear more about later, uh, more or fewer uh, esters can be made. Uh, and the common ones that you probably know about are ethyl ethylpropionate, isoamyl acetate, or isobutyl acetate as well, um, ethyl caproate. Um, ever, ever wonder what... Um, what those apple peels smell like when you peel apples to, to maybe to bake a pie. Well, that, that's it. Uh, and then uh, various other uh, esters that are uh, combinations with uh, various amino acids. Maybe, maybe the most important thing for, uh, for us as uh, Sauvignon producers are the volatile thiols. 
And uh, I, to me, the volatile thiols, maybe coupled with the pyrazines, are the soul of Sauvignon Blanc character. Um, I, I set up this slide so you could actually see these very cumbersome, cumbersome names. Um, uh, for MMP, for mercaptomethylpentanone, mercap mercaptohexanol acetate, mercaptohexan hexan all, mercaptomethylpentan all, and uh, benzene methylthiol. So these are very, very com complex, but you notice that they all have uh, mercapto in, in, the, in the name of the chemical formula. And um, mercaptans is something that winemakers worry a, worry a lot about, reduced sulfur compounds. However, these all have that same uh, sulfhydryl group in, in them, uh, and I think with the potential to give us sometimes uh, very, very trace elements uh, that, that are reductive, uh, that, that people refer to as minerality. In fact, this one, benzene methyl, methane thiol, actually uh, is minerally smoky flinty. Uh, and then there are the possible orders as well. Um, so just to show you these same things again without their long names, uh, here, are their thresh here are their perception thresholds, uh, very, very low. These are nanograms per liter. You remember uh, uh, parts per million, right? Milligrams per liter, parts per, parts per billion, right? Microgram per liter. Well, these are parts per trillion, nanogram per liter. Or uh, as I tell my students, that's one inch in 16 million miles as a size, as a size comparison. So um, they're very, 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 very trace, uh, very, very low perception thresholds. And yet look at the concentration that is found in wines. So, so they're, they're all likely to be there. Most of them are likely to be there. And uh, they help define Sauvignon Blanc character. And the higher they are, the more aggressive they are. And uh, uh, so we have to decide how, mu how much we want. There are some interesting ways to, um, to make sure that you can capture and retain and maybe increase this thiol production. The thiol precursors are there, but it's our handling of, of uh, grapes and must that helps to facilitate their conversion. And um, uh, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Kotsia, Kotsia is here from South Africa. Where, where are you sitting? Oh, there she is. <laughs> so she actually published uh, some lovely papers in the April and the current uh, May Wines and Vines about uh, maximization of thiols. And, so I took some bullet points here from her, her paper, uh, and then I'm gonna show you a few slides about uh, what, what we do in, when, I, when I was working in New Zealand, that, uh, and she'll be gratified to see that what we were doing was accidentally everything right. So uh, skin contact is really necessary for good uh, pre-fermentation extraction, and skin contact in whites is something that California winemakers sort of abhor, you know, do we want to do that? What, what, what risk is there of soaking out phenolics and bitterness and so forth? Well, you know, of course, everything is temperature dependent, isn't it? So uh, I think that's a trade-off or that's a juggling act that you can very easily accomplish. Uh, and in fact, the, the norm in New Zealand is, uh, it's cold. <laughs> it's really cold there. But the norm in New Zealand is uh, mechanical harvesting. And so sure enough, uh, the maceration uh, from mechanical harvesting and the time that the truck takes to get to the winery is, is um, a, a wonderful unintended benefit. I have to tell you, if you're worried about that skin contact, uh, those truck drivers have very, very strict time deliver, delivery times written into their contracts. Uh, some of them have, a, have to be, from, from departure to weighing in, have to be 30 minutes some of them 45, they are very, very, very short. They put a very short leash on those. And uh, I have followed some of those trucks from the field to the winery and you can't keep up with them because there aren't enough trucks to go around. 
and they don't really have to be told they have a time limit. They, they need to get there as fast as possible so they can go make some more money. Um, also important is rapid, ox rapid addition of antioxidants, sulfites, ascorbic acid, uh, because they actually prevent oxidation of these thiols, or these thiol precursors. And uh, in New Zealand, both, both are added right there on the spot. Um, uh, sometimes enzymes are added in the field as well. Sometimes they're added uh, a little bit later on. But uh, I've got some pictures of, uh, go through very quickly of what we, what we did. Berry sample, of course, to see what's ripe. Bring in tons and tons of uh, samples to the lab to, to run analysis and see if we need to call those, call those truckers and set them in motion. Uh, which can happen 24 hours a day, by the way, night harvest, 24 hour harvesting. Um, once that is uh, set in motion, pretty much all of the Sauvignon Blanc that I worked with was uh, machine picked. Uh, and that machine harvester has, has two, two and a half gondolas on it. So two and a half and two and a half is five. Those, th those, those uh, gondolas uh, tip, uh, tip forward to deliver those five tons, and then the harvester runs around and a, a mobile unit runs around to collect the next five tons, which dumps into the truck. The trucks are pretty uniformly 10 tons, and they take off like a bat out of hell. Um, this is uh, something I thought you'd be interested in seeing, because this, this was at the, um, on the uh, bulletin board at the winery right near Grape Reception. And these are the, uh, the, 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 the center uh, uh, list is the most important one to talk about now, uh, which specifies how much metabisulfite and how much ascorbic acid is to be added per, per uh, five ton gondola, two of which go into a 10 ton truck. Uh, very, very, very important. And in fact, just so no one forgets it, when you come up, come and pick up your orders, there are the crates of metabisulfite and ascorbic acid waiting for you. So there's no doubt about it. One bottle goes into a gondola, okay? Uh, so these are all picked up by the growers before, or, or by the uh, uh, harvesters before they go out and start their harvest. So very, very important. I had a little experience with receiving machine picked Sauvignon Blanc over in uh, uh, Russian River Valley and uh, I don't know about you, but after making wine for a long time in California, I, I was sort of shuddered at the thought of machine-picked whites. Uh, and then, uh, then I thought, well, you know, as long as I stay there and watch over things. And uh, I spent the night before weighing out little cups of, of uh, potassium metabisulfite and taking them, out to, uh, taking them out to the vineyard. It, it might have helped. <laughs> uh, so here we are, two, two and a half tonners being dumped into a truck. And that's what, that's what a full truck looks like. Are you worried about the uh, metabisulfite being mixed in? You don't need to be. The, just the rapid motion and the starting and stopping and the vibration of these trucks, it's, it's uh, well mixed by the time it gets there. Uh, and it's uh, pretty rapidly dumped into uh, uh, a hopper with load-bearing cells on the feet. And then um, uh, that hopper is, is tipped and the juice is is then um, drained out and solid as 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 the same at the same time as the solids are conveyed to the press. Doesn't that make you thirsty? Just uh, I can smell it from here. So uh, uh, the veggie grassy herbal, uh, green grass, dry grass, hay, uh, vegetal uh, smells of course, are from uh, MIBP, methoxyisobutylpyrazine. And, uh, but, but there's also uh, some contribution from thiols, uh, not bell pepper per se, but some of, the, uh, some of the smells that I call vegetal stems or cut, fresh cut celery and so forth may be contributed by, by thiols. Uh, and there's a possible uh, low level contribution to uh, minerality. Um, it may be just my imagination, but when I smell uh, what we call minerality in a wine, uh, I, sometimes I say, well, that just might be, that might be a thiol, or that might be a, low, a trace amount of pyrazine. Uh, we'll, we'll see when uh, further research uh, comes along. Um, aldehydes make some minor con contributions, 
but not too many uh, if you've used a lot of sulfites in, in your wine. Uh, then we have the, uh, the stylized uh, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, which, is, uh, what, which is what we tend to do to uh, white wines in the, in the New World, resulting in vanillin, other lactones, uh, butter, furfural, guayacol. Uh, sometimes that comes from forest fires, but uh, it can also come from uh, a barrel. Uh, some Surlees character, depending on whether or not we undertake that, that uh, fermentation technique, and uh, honey, uh, nectary, and hay. The, the honey, nectary, hay uh, characteristic to me is a marker for old, an older world Sauvignon Blanc, something that has been uh, uh, matured in less uh, anaerobic uh, casks. Uh, if we choose to do malo malolactic fermentation, of course, we know the range of flavors that add that adds to our Sauvignon Blanc. These are non-Sauvignon Blanc odors, but they they exist in Sauvignon Blanc as is presented in certain parts of the world. Uh, diacetyl, the creaminess of mouthfeel that results, and also the pungent note from uh, that we get from uh, uh, yeast cell autolysis over time. So, what's with this minerality? Uh, boy, that's a really tough one. Uh, I just finished with a co-author uh, a, a new book with UC Press called Wine and Place, a terroir reader. And we deal with that extensively in, uh, in the sensory chapter uh, because everybody wants to know what it is. And so what we mostly know is what it's not. It's not minerals. Um, but it may be trace uh, concentration of pyrazines. That's an IMHO comment, in my humble opinion. Another one is trace con concentration of thiols, maybe, can be mistaken for earthiness or minerality, or maybe trace levels of sulfide from, uh, from those thiols or from those thiols uh, decomposing over time, uh, or from the, the one that we call BMT, benzyl methyl thiol. Very, very possibly. We're on the verge of finding out. So I thought, uh, uh, finally, I would show you, uh, uh, give you sort of a world tour uh, of Sauvignon Blancs in various, various flavor niches around the world, starting with uh, the same uh, map that Dr. Jones uh, put up. Um, <clears throat> so the main, the main regions being uh, the, the old world regions, which I'll show you on, a, on another map in a moment, but also uh, California in the sites that we know in California. Um, uh, South, South America, Chile, and uh, on the other side of the continent, U Uruguay, uh, the, w the Western Cape in South Africa, marvelous, marvelous sites there. Uh, the Adelaide Hills in, in um, uh, Australia, and of course all the various sites in uh, New Zealand, and uh, all, Ze all New Zealand so savvies do not taste alike. There's a wide, wide range of climate difference uh, as, you, as you go from North Island down through the, through the South Island. So uh, quite a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, here is a map showing some of our old world role models, so to speak. Uh, the the uh, Loire Valley is certainly a role model, the upper Loire. The Loire is the longest river in France, but back closer to its origins, where you see that green area around uh, Sancerre and Puy Fume. Uh, that is, that's that very uh, uh, cold continental climate uh, where, we get, where we got the original uh, uh, Puy Fume, or the original, I guess you'd say, Fume Blanc. Huh? Uh, and then uh, on the west coast, Bordeaux, uh, more of a, a, a wet and cold and pretty fairly rainy uh, maritime climate. Uh, Northern Italy, where I worked a bit, Friuli, and um, in that region above, at the top of the Adriatic Sea, very, very different climate as well. Alto Adige, which is also known as Sud, 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 Sud Tirol, thank you, um, uh, produces some, some really, really excellent. Uh, if you hop up into, go east a bit and hop up into uh, Austria, uh, Sud Steiermark is, is a notable uh, area. So the, these are our old world role models showing us what Sauvignon can do, but uh, we've taken that in hand and uh, we're producing fine, fine Sauvignons ev everywhere. 
In fact, the ones that I'll just sort of quickly uh, list for you, uh, various terroirs of, of uh, Sauvignon, uh, all the AVAs that we've been shown in Lake County, uh, Russian River Valley over the hill, uh, Stellenbosch on the Western Cape, uh, Valle Casablanca in Chile, Marlboro, uh, the, the Wairau River Valley in uh, New Zealand, the uh, Sancerre Puy Fumé in France, Grave in France, uh, Zud Steiermark in Austria, and then uh, uh, Friuli, <laughs> Colion, Colion, yeah, Fri Friuli Colio in Northern Italy. So Lake County, uh, a very, very simple summary here, uh, as opposed to the, the, the climatic and soil uh, uh, talk you just had a minute ago. Uh, but the, so I'll, I'll, I'll ignore the climate and the soils, but the flavor profile, good varietal typicity and good acid structure, tropical fruit esters, moderate pineapple grapefruit, herbal grassy, long finish, riper fruit flavors as desired. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the Sauvignon Blancs at dinner last night. And, and if you, I thought about this much later, I should have taken bottles to my room. Uh, I, I, if you step back and squint at them, there was a flavor thread running through all of them that I, I think I have a take on it now. I think I have a, I think I have a mental photograph of a snapshot of it now that I'll never, never forget. When you have that many in front of you, that's how you can develop that 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 terroir feel. Yes, they had something similar to a lot of other Sauvignon Blancs I've had, but but it was the quality of the 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 the, uh, the, the way they expressed their thiols and their and their green flavors. And it was also their particular intensity. They weren't in your face aggressive. They were they were more of a of a, of a veil or of a layer. And they didn't they didn't dominate uh, the the whole the total wine. Uh, Russian River Valley. Uh, uh, I enjoyed working over there with uh, uh, since I live in Ukiah. I enjoyed nothing more than jumping down into to uh, Sonoma County in the uh, harvest mornings and being enveloped by fog. It was, just, it was lovely. Uh, so they have their coastal air conditioning, making them um, less, maybe less like here and more like other places. Uh, great asset structure. And I tend to define more grapefruit, pineapple type thiols uh, in, those, in those wines, along with some of the herbal grassy. South Africa. Got to work there several times, wish I'd had more, uh, but very, uh, very lovely flavor profile, good acidity, tropical, spicy fruit, uh, lychee, lemongrass. Uh, and the interesting thing about being in the Western Cape is that you, especially if you're at, at altitude, and I was up at uh, 12, 12, uh, 1200 meters. So does that, where's Phil? Does that sound right? No, no, 1,200 feet. 1,200 feet, thank you. Uh, up, up right along the, fin, the Finbos, up along the edge of the hills. And um, when, when I was down at, on, at, at lower altitudes, the air was fairly still. But once you got up on those higher altitudes, you, you felt the Atlantic breezes uh, and Indian, Indian Ocean breezes. And so you had that, that windy, cooling uh, condition during the ripening period that I think made those flavors. Uh, in Chile, in Valle Casablanca, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't able to visit there until just last year, uh, but uh, uh, the interesting thing about it is it is it's a latitudinal valley. It's a, most of the valleys, wine, wine growing valleys in Chile are like ours in California. They, they're behind rows of coastal hills and they run north and south, but Valle Casablanca runs east and west, and so the maritime influence spills spills right in from the ocean, and uh, it actually reminded me a lot of Carneros, uh, the, the the feel of the air and, and the and the coastal influence. So uh, a little more green apple, a grapefruit and fig uh, down there, uh, and a little bit more citrus. So that might speak to a certain type of thiol being produced more, more than others. Uh, Marlboro, uh, very firm acidity, very firm structure, uh, pungent, racy, 
um, in fact, uh, uh, okay, uh, net nettles. Um, had an interesting discussion one time with a chef in one of my classes about nettles, and they and he said, how, how can you use nettles as a descriptor? Green, green nettles, they, they're flavorless. And so I, I researched this. I said, oh, okay. I researched this after class, and he's right. Uh, they, they have no flavor. It depends on what you cook them with. So uh, I think the, the use of the descriptor is to imply something green, in other words, vegetal, and something sharp, as in acidity. So why not just say nettles? It, it made sense and once, I, once I got used to it. Uh, gooseberry, citrus, and uh, nice herbaceous notes. Uh, the, the Loire Valley, uh, again, pretty good acid structure. Grapefruit, citrus, nettles. Uh, they don't say that. I borrowed that from New Zealand. Uh, uh, some white floral notes and, uh, and, and flint, flintiness. There may be more of that, of that uh, BMT produced there. I don't know that for a fact. I'm just guessing. Uh, all I know is I was walking a vineyard in uh, Puy-sur-Loire with a grower, and we, I thought I was in Lake County. We were, we were, we were walking on all kinds of flint, and, uh, and I think there might have, I don't think there was obsidian, but it, it, felt, it felt really crunchy. And, uh, and we got back to the, the winery in the lab, and, and we, were, uh, we were tasting the wine that was made from that block of grapes. And he said, see, there's flintiness in the wine. And I thought, mm, no, there, there can't be that flint in this wine. But I had such a powerful memory association with the place where it was from, having immediately tasted the wine right after, that I think there's, I think there's something to that. We have to explore that as a possible uh, terroir uh, builder, terroir perception builder. Uh, Grave, more of the coastal influence. Uh, often, often Sauvignon Blanc is blended with Semillon. And uh, flavor profile, firm acidity, citrus, white peach, Sometimes a little, a little bit of uh, pithiness, uh, and that's a, a, little, a little bit of traction on the palate. That's the, that's the term that I use for traction on the palate that relates to probably uh, some phenolic content. Uh, a, little bit of, a little bit of the cat, and uh, a subtle oak influence, uh, or, to, or a profound oak influence, depending on how it's, how it's fermented and, and uh, how it's handled. Um, uh, and, and also, um, the, the resulting flavor is dependent on how much so semillon is blended in. Uh, I get a, a little background touch of a botrytis flavor in a lot of Grave whites, and I think that's due to the fact that they're a coastal climate and they have a lot of botrytis, and they probably pick it anyway. So, Okay, uh, in southern Austria, Zuid Steiermark, I haven't been able to, to uh, work there yet, but uh, very clean, very uh, also acid-driven, uh, austere. The fruit expression is not as aggressive as Sauvignon elsewhere in the world, but it's, it's more subtle and um, uh, sort of light, a light spice. And then finally, uh, there we are, Colion again, Friuli Colio. Um, very, um, very interesting, interesting place. The Sauvignon Blanc is l lighter, maybe a little bit less distinctive if you put it on a, on a New Zealand scale, but uh, very, very good true uh, Sauvignon Blanc character with some citrus, uh, citrus zest notes and, uh, a, a wa and waxy notes, and that's actually more of a flavor in my mouth than an odor for me. So I want to I want to mention a few of the references that I uh, that I showed you in passing, uh, because and you should be able to have access to this uh, paper, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so you can copy these down. Don't bother to try to do it now. But uh, there's been some great work. There was some great work done by uh, Denis de Bourdieu in um, uh, Bordeaux. Uh, also, uh, Cynthia Lund and many others in New Zealand are doing great work on Sauvignon Blanc flavor profile. Um, and I uh, wish I'd had time to show you some results of that paper because that paper in particular uh, uh, divides up Sauvignon Blanc character by regions of the world. And, this, and the data was collected from trained tasters who tasted in triplicate blind and unknowingly 
broke the flavor profiles of Sauvignon down into different parts of the world. So it's, this is, it's fascinating, fascinating work. And uh, so we can thank Cynthia Lund and um, uh, Hildegard Heyman up at Davis for, for that work, as well as others. Uh, and then um, uh, Dr. Kotsia, who's, who's uh, with us uh, this weekend or today, uh, I, I gave her two uh, papers that are currently available in Wines and Vines prominence. Um, she's going to be uh, Ms. Thiel for the world, I think, showing us, showing us where they come from and uh, how, how to capture them. If, now that we know that our consumers understand that that's what Sauvignon Blanc tastes like, let's give it to them. Okay, let's, let's give it to them. Okay, so to, to conclude... Oh, good, 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 good. So uh, to conclude, uh, Sauvignon Blanc is uh, quite a grape chameleon. Uh, it's got an incredible me medley of flavors that uh, liaisons with uh, uh, quite a variety on the food side. Racy acidity, structure and flavors that, uh, that embrace rather than fight or clash. And I think it may be uh, one of our most terroir expressive wines. Um, thanks to all of these sponsors. This is a huge undertaking, and this would not be possible um, uh, without all of these sponsors. Thank you so, so much. And uh, thank, thank you from me as well. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I look forward to talking to all of you.